The hippocampus, meaning seahorse, named for its curved shape, is an important component of the brain. Much is still unknown about the hippocampus, but it is now widely accepted that the hippocampus plays important roles in episodic memory and navigation. The hippocampus is an elaboration of the edge of the medial temporal cortex. It is a paired structure, with one being found in each hemisphere of the brain. A cross-section of the hippocampus reveals the important areas within it. The major groups of cell bodies which make up the hippocampal formation are the CA areas. These together are the hippocampus proper. They are named cornu ammonis, meaning ram's horn, due to their shape. There are four of these areas, and they progress in sequence. CA4, CA3, CA2, and CA1. The main cells in this part of the hippocampus are pyramidal cells. The next area is the dentate gyrus, so named because of its resemblance to a tooth. The cells in this area are called granule cells, so named because they have tiny cell bodies. The next area is the subiculum. This is continuous with the cornuomonas areas and is also composed of pyramidal neurons. The final area is the entorhinal cortex. This is an area of the cerebral cortex adjacent to the hippocampus. The function of the hippocampus is defined by the connections within and between the different areas. All input into the hippocampal formation enters through the entorhinal cortex. The axons of the entorhinal cortex project mostly to the cells in the dentate gyrus, but also into CA3 and CA1. This fibre tract is known as the perforant path, as it perforates the subiculum. The cells in the dentate gyrus then project their axons, known as mossy fibres, to the spiny dendrites of the cells in CA3. The cells in CA3 then send their axons, known as Schaffer collaterals, to the cells in CA1. There are also many recurrent connections within CA3. The cells in CA1 then send their axons to the cells in the subiculum, and the cells in the subiculum complete the loop by sending their projections back to the entorhinal cortex. One of the most popular theories concerning the role of the hippocampus in episodic memory is hippocampal indexing theory. This theory states that when we have a conscious experience, many different areas of the neocortex are activated, corresponding to the different aspects of that experience. For example, the visual cortex for the visual aspect and the auditory cortex for the auditory aspects, etc. When we remember that episode later on, similar areas of the neocortex are reactivated, and this is what results in our re experiencing of the event. The hippocampus acts as an index, storing the different patterns of neocortex activity associated with all our different memories. The process is thought to be as follows The entorhinal cortex receives input from all parts of the neocortex in a compressed manner. It then projects through the perforant pathway to the dentate gyrus and then from the dentate gyrus to CA3. The CA3 area is thought to act as an auto-associator due to its dense reciprocal connections. Each pattern of neocortex activity results in a unique input pattern, activating a unique subpopulation of neurons. Due to the dense reciprocal connections, when these neurons are activated at the same time, the connections between them are strengthened. This is due to the synaptic plasticity we learnt about in previous videos. This allows for a process called pattern completion. In the future, whenever a feature of the original experience is present, it activates a portion of the previous neurons. These then activate any other neurons that they're strongly connected to, allowing recall of a whole memory from just a part of an experience. However, in order for the CA3 auto-associator to work correctly, inputs need to be relatively unique. If inputs to an auto-associator are very similar, interference can occur. For example, imagine we have an auto-associator which is presented with the number sequences 3, 4, and 5, and 5, 6, 7. Each activate a unique set of neurons and result in separately indexed memories. Now, when pattern completing, there is an overlap between the two inputs. This means the outputs may be either of the memories and the network will get confused. To avoid this, we need a process known as pattern separation. This is essentially where a network will take in two patterns and produce an output which is less similar. The dentate gyrus is thought to be this pattern separator. The mechanism of pattern separation in the dentate gyrus is not completely understood, but multiple possibilities have been proposed. One possible mechanism may be that there are many more cells in the dentate gyrus which project onto relatively fewer cells in CA3. 
meaning the chance that any two populations of cells in the dentate gyrus project to the same cells in CA3 is low. Therefore, the dentate gyrus ensures that unique populations of cells get activated each time. However, evidence suggests this may not be the only mechanism. Differences in spiking frequency are another possibility. The higher frequency a dentate gyrus neuron fires, the more neurotransmitter it releases, and the more likely it is to activate the downstream CA3 neuron. The dentate gyrus cells change their firing rate with new information, with some increasing their frequency and some decreasing their frequency. So, changes in frequency, with some dentate gyrus neurons increasing their frequency and some decreasing their frequency, could also activate unique populations of cells. So now we've seen how a memory consists of patterns of neocortical activation, which can be condensed and sent to the entorhinal cortex, undergo pattern separation, and then bound together are indexed in the CA3 autoassociator. Then, when a feature of the original stimulus is present, it activates a subpopulation of the original neurons activated in CA3, and the recurrent connections allow reactivation of the remaining neurons making up the pattern. The final step is to see how the hippocampus reactivates the appropriate areas of the cortex. This is thought to be mediated by CA1. The entorhinal cortex not only projects to the dentate gyrus, but also to CA1. This means that when the neurons are activated in CA3, also activated in CA1 is another representation of the cortical pattern. As these two populations of neurons are activated at the same time, they undergo long-term potentiation, and the connections between them are strengthened. This means that neurons from CA3 activate the neurons in CA1 corresponding to the correct cortical areas. These then project back to the entorhinal cortex, which has reciprocal connections to many areas of the cortex, reactivating the same combination of cortical areas as the input and causing us to re-experience the event as a memory.